Your company announced a successful proof of concept last week. How does it work? Um, great. It's Oxhead Alpha. Oxhead, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry for the, uh, that's the pronunciation. That's how the word alpha came um, out. The, uh, the proof of concept with DMV was um, an interesting exercise in moving toward, uh, you know, the implementer side of the blockchain spectrum. We see a lot of uh, news and activity around speculation, and our focus has always really been um, as implementers, uh, advancing protocols and doing some research and development, and also searching for that elusive real-world use case. Um, the partnership with the DMV is uh, almost a perfect matchup of, uh, you know, a system based on paper that has been uh, sort of crying out for more efficiency um, and pairing it with blockchain. And in this particular case with uh, Tezos has enabled, I think, um, just a, a very clear case of better, faster, cheaper. Um, so the, the titles are represented um, as digital assets on chain, which is a nice mirror of the real world case where they're represented as pieces of paper. Um, but the DMV is not removed from the transaction process. So while the uh, end users are able to initiate transfers, DMV still has oversight because the implementation is a, a lot like an escrow contract. Um, there are certain things that you need to do with a title in order to affect a, a real transfer, even a paper title. You have to pay tax, you have to verify odometers, um, and all of that can now be done digitally and asynchronously. So um, I think that there's a, a lot of efficiencies gained, not just for the consumers, but also on the administrative side. So uh, by the way, uh, Oxhead Alpha, I, I, that's an interesting reference. I see that's the world the, of hashes, the okay, of the, the letter so sometimes alpha. it gets confused. <laughs> Well, it, it, it's the origin of the letter alpha, right? Is Oxhead, right? I, I love the, it. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. We are an infrastructure yeah, company. I, I, we do a lot of plumbing yeah. and uh, we want to be listed first in the phone book. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, um, the, the, the question about the odometers and things like that. So how, what is the process going to be like or how would it, how would it work? Would you take a photo of the odometer? How would it, I, w and would the DMV have the right or the ability to, to block the transaction from occurring? I mean, I, I, I'm not familiar with California. I know in New Jersey, uh, if, you have the, if you have the title, someone signs the back and it's theirs. Who cares what happens after that? And, and uh, all they have to do is show up and say, hey, this car is mine now. Uh, but, I mean, it's probably a different process too, but that's how I've sold my clunkers. Um, but what what uh, what what role does it, do you have with verification with the odometers? Is it like foot, it, like what's the process here? No, you're you're absolutely right that the you know physical possession of a title means ownership, and um, I think that's why there's such a it, an interesting role for blockchain to play here, right? The um, idea that you have this global open source standards-based network with a battle-hardened platform for transacting digital goods with identity and non-repudiation built into it. Um, you know, it's a, a platform for ensuring consumer safety, ensuring that, um, you know, fraud vectors that actually exist in the paper world. A lot of people think, well, paper, you can't do better. Um, there are issues around paper titles, um, I mean, first, it turns out you can run out of paper. Uh, last year, there, there's only two companies left that produce the, the paper that titles are printed on. And um, because of supply chain issues last year, there were long delays in people actually being able to take possession of their titles. Um, as far as verifying the information that's present on a title, there's the existing workflows that happen today uh, within the DMV, attestation by both buyer and seller. Um, the, the digital model that we've put together on blockchain uh, mirrors that where you need attestation from both parties about the odometer, but you can easily imagine um, oracles that spring up and have, uh, you know, connected car infrastructure to feed these contracts and uh, provide further levels of automation and, um, and verification.
Um, can you talk a little bit about why Tezos? Like, why is that? Um, what, what, what can you just like the thinking behind that choice? Sure. Um, so, you know, we've been working a long time uh, sort of in the space uh, in government, trying to educate legislators and people about what blockchain is. Um, you know, first and foremost, it's not an infinite free database. Uh, that was an early misconception. Um, but you know, trying to, to get people to the point where they understood that once you find that place where you have a reason to use a blockchain, um, you're not done. Now you have to figure out what blockchain to use. And, you know, the, the, the why Tezos question boiled down to um, really three areas. Uh, first and foremost, a responsible consensus algorithm. Um, you know, this was proof of work versus proof of stake. And Tezos being one of the first proof of stake uh, chains out there with a mainnet um, really drew us to it. Uh, second, governance and the forking problem. So uh, the forking problem is real. The Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, and blockchains don't exist in isolation. They are social constructs. Um, and so as a platform uh, developer, somebody seeking to deploy applications to a chain, you've been you know, told time and again, this is an immutable uh, source of truth. This is, uh, you know, do it once and get it right. Um, you put your application on a chain and then you wake up one day and it turns out there's not one source of truth, there's two. And you have to pick which universe to follow. Uh, it's not fair. <laughs> um, and so in Tezos, the forking problem is mitigated by the on-chain governance. Um, and, you know, we've seen this time and again with um, protocol upgrades that happen on-chain with stakeholder voting. Um, and finally, the security model. Um, Tezos has uh, got a on-chain smart contracting language that is uh, essentially each block is a pure function. There's not, you know, no side effects, uh, re-entrancy attacks, some, some vectors that, um, you know, are possible to exploit on other chains just can't happen on Tezos. So we felt like it was a good mm -hmm. choice. You mentioned that you've been talking to governments, you know, California's Governor Newsom signed an executive order promoting blockchain last May, but then vetoed a crypto licensing and regulation bill in September amid the contagion we've been seeing in the crypto markets. With FTX collapsing shortly after that, what's your outlook on the state of blockchain adoption and research in California under Governor Newsom's leadership? Yeah, so I think it's um, it's reasonable to see this kind of uh, back and forth. The it really mirrors what I was talking about earlier with the speculators versus implementers. Um, and while the speculation is out there, and uh, that's a sort of entire culture unto itself, sort of quietly moving along, the implementers are making um, enormous strides in the underlying technology that drives these chains. Uh, you're seeing, you know, massive improvements in scalability. You're seeing uh, sort of new economic models, um, faster consensus, better block times. Um, so, you know, it's are you meeting, far from are you being met with area. a lot of criticism from from policymakers from from government, or are they encouraging? No, I think they see very clearly the split between speculation and application. Um, and when you get into the application and you can ex explain the benefits, um, they see they see the massive costs on the infrastructure and the aging infrastructure and maintenance that they have. And they're looking for ways to bring that um, into the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you know, understanding that the speculators are there, they are able to separate that from the, is, the implementation. Is there a timeline for this to go live? Oh, yes. Um, the the uh, out of administration out there is actually very forward thinking. And um, we should have systems in production this first quarter. Now, production in this um, sense means a shadow ledger, which will be our first step in the path to full deployment. Um, kind of like uh, the you know cloud migrations happen with a lift and shift strategy. You want to make sure that you have parallel systems that reach parity. So you know, will people, this will be a reality for people in California to use the blockchain for car titles this year? Um, their titles will be on a blockchain. Their interface will be exactly as they know. So the, um, you know, as the, 
uh, modernization efforts out in California, DMV keep a pace. Uh, they are working on sort of front ends that will enable people to do all kinds of services. They've got some uh, digital identity things going this on year. out there. Um, that is, I guess, subject to their own timelines on user-facing okay. stuff. But as far as the back end, yes, this year.